The window below it is the death of Mary. When Christ died during the crucifixion, he commended his mother into the care of his youngest apostle, who was John the Evangelist. And the tradition is that after the crucifixion, John assumed caring for Mary. Uh, finally, he moved to the island of Samos, and that is traditionally the place where Mary died. In this particular window, she is surrounding, surrounded rather, by the apostles who remained, uh, who were not dispersed at the time. Uh, this again is a non-canonical window. You will not find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The last two windows, the window on the top, shows the crowning of Mary, Queen of Heaven. This is actually a type of window you would have seen in an Eastern church. In the Western churches, when this is depicted, usually the father and son are above Mary, placing the crown on her head. Here in this picture, Mary and Jesus are sitting on a rainbow, and Jesus is placing the crown on her head, which is bowed. Angels are in the background, cherubim, seraphim. The window below it is, I find, one of the more interesting windows in the church. It depicts the death of Joseph, Jesus' foster father. In this window, Joseph has already passed away. His eyes are closed, if you look at the window closely. Standing in the background, there is a young boy, young adolescent, and he has begun the Jewish prayers for the dead. Jesus is standing near the head of the bed, and he is giving his blessing to Joseph. Mary is also standing right behind him. There is another lady standing at the foot of the bed who is believed to be Jesus' friend Martha. But if you look very, very closely at this picture, there is a gentleman peering through the door into the scene. The man standing in the doorway, we believe, is Francis Xavier Zettler, the fellow who executed the windows. We think he painted himself into his own work. This is not unusual. Uh, this was done very, very often in European churches. The windows in the downtown side of the church depict the life of Christ. They begin with the nativity. It is very rarely that you find a night scene depicted in a stained glass window. But in our church, we have one. And at certain times of the day, you can actually see when the sun shines on the window, the little town of Bethlehem in the background. This is something unique to Zettler's windows. Whenever he depicted an interior scene, if there was a window in the background, he always depicted a scene that you could see outside through the window. The windows here are unique also because they are like regular paintings. They have two-point perspective in them, just like you would if you were painting a canvas. Uh, the way the nativity is handled, the brightest part of the picture is the Christ child in the manger, and when the sun shines on the window, it looks like there is light coming from the Christ child onto Mary's face first, and then onto Joseph's face, and then onto the shepherds who are at the stable in Bethlehem. It's quite a unique window. The next window up is the visit of the kings, the Magi, Caspar, Malchior, and Baltazar. And Mary in that window is depicted almost in the pose of a Byzantine icon. Uh, for some reason, that is the way Zetla chose to depict her. On the floor in front of her is the scepter of one of the three wise men or one of the three kings. That is a prefiguration of Christ. Also, there are two red roses uh, that tell you that Mary will suffer at the crucifixion, and her heart will break. The next window up is Christ teaching in the temple when he was about 12 years old. Uh, Mary and Joseph had gone to celebrate Passover. Uh, Jesus got lost, 
and they found him standing in the temple preaching among the temple elders. In picture, the gentleman who is in red sitting in the chair with the pot of scrolls next to him is none other than Zacharias. The fellow sitting across from him reading the book is one of the newer uh, members of the temple hierarchy. And if you notice where Jesus is standing, his placement is between the two. And he is uniting the books of the Old and the New Testament in that window. The next window up is the garden at Gethsemane with Jesus, St. Peter, who is holding the sword, James and John, who are asleep. And Jesus is kneeling there. This is at the moment when he begs that the cup can be passed from him. The angel who is holding the cup is the angel Uriel. He is the angel of death. Uh, most people think of the angel of death as being a very dark figure. But in the tradition of the Christian churches, both East and West, Uriel is usually an angel dressed in golden raiment and his wings uh, have all of the colors of the rainbow. And he is holding the cup, passing it on to Jesus. In the background, you can actually see the Temple Mount. And that is one of the pictures where you can see every single blade of grass. The next two windows up, the top window depicts the resurrection of Christ. This window is rather strange because it shows the tomb where Christ was buried as having a square entrance. And in the Gospels, it is specifically stated that the angels rolled the stone away from the opening. And in this picture, the stone blocking the entrance is square. This is based on an Italian painting done in the 1500s. I think it was by Giotto, but I'm not sure. And in that painting, Jesus is coming forth. The two Roman soldiers out of there are very much afraid. There is an angel kneeling at the entrance to the tomb. The angel, once again, is Uriel, the angel of death, but also the angel of the earth. He has control over everything that is created. So he is also there at the resurrection. Beneath him is the Passion. This takes place on Good Friday. In that window, you see Christ sitting down. The Roman soldier applying the crown of thorns, we believe, is a German. When Pontius Pilate went to Jerusalem, he brought two cohorts of Roman soldiers. One of them were Germani, who were recruited in the area of southern Germany. The other ones were Keltoi. The Keltoi lived in western France, Britannia, and in Ireland. The German has a beard because the Germani were the only troops in the Roman army who were allowed to grow beards. Uh, that was by a special uh, agreement made with them when they joined as auxiliaries. The Keltoi, on the other hand, had to be clean shaven. So there's another Roman soldier in the painting standing close to the right, carrying a spear. And if you look at him, he's clean shaven. So there's a possibility that he is an Irishman. Kneeling down in the picture, uh, there is a fellow in a white turban whose face is halfway blocked by the center post of the picture. His complexion is rather dark. Over on Magazine Street, there was a family that owned a grocery store who were Assyrians, but they were Assyrian Catholics. And they came to this church. Also in the picture, you will see a fellow in a red turban and cloak. His skin tone is yellowish. We had several Chinese working in laundries along Magazine Street. Uh, kneeling down in front of Christ, you will see an African with very large earrings. In this neighborhood, there are a lot of ex-slaves who were Catholics who attended this church. But the fellow I find most interesting is the fellow in the green tunic uh, with the big golden sash and 
the red headband. He is a Choctaw Indian. And if you look closely, his skin has a reddish skin tone. Everyone depicted in this window would have lived or worked within walking distance of this church. And we think that they were specifically included in this picture uh, to depict the people who used to come to services here. The last two windows, uh, the window on the bottom is the crucifixion. And it shows the darkness at noon, the sun is blood red. Standing at the foot of the cross are Mary, the Apostle John, Mary Magdalene is kneeling at Jesus' feet. The Russian, cent the Roman centurion rather, who finally delivers the coup de grace, the spear thrust into, into Jesus' chest, is also standing there. This is before the spear thrust has been made. This is the Roman soldier who in the gospel is quoted as saying, surely this was the son of God. But also standing in the background in this picture is Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea is the personage who donated the tomb for Christ to be buried in. Traditionally, he is also thought to be the person who brought Christianity to the British Isles and hence to the Irish. So he is depicted in the window as well. The window above is the ascension and you will find Christ and all of the apostles there with the exception of Judas of course. Uh, this is before St. Jude Thaddeus was chosen to replace Judas. So you will only see 11 apostles in this window but they are all there and it depicts the ascension as a twilight scene where Christ is ascending into heaven. The odd thing about our windows that depict the life of Christ is that six of the eight windows depict more or less nighttime scenes or scenes of darkness, which make those particular windows unique as well. A few comments about the church. The church itself is based on a design of two buildings in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the first one is St. Alphonsus Church. Uh, it has towers, bell towers on it. And uh, that was the Redemptorist Church in Baltimore. It is done in a Romanesque style outside. Inside the church is uh, high Italianate Baroque. It is based on the Church of the Immaculate Conception, which was a Jesuit church in Baltimore. The only difference between that church and this one is that this building has a balcony and the Jesuit church does not. Uh, the altars on the church are rather unique. The altar on the side of the church with the merry windows uh, depicts St. Joseph. And standing next to St. Joseph are his in-laws, St. Anne and St. Joachim. So sometimes this high altar, is re this side altar rather, is referred to as the altar of a happy marriage. And when the Redemptorists used to preach missions, they would stress this fact. One of their sermons would be uh, one intended to keep families together. The other side altar primarily is the side altar of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. This is the National Shrine of Our Lady of Perpetual Help. This is where the Novena craze in New Orleans began. It started uh, in the late years of the 1920s, uh, shortly before the stock market crashed. And once the market crashed, people were very much interested in coming to these churches to pray. Uh, our Novena services were held on a Tuesday. The first one started at 5 o'clock in the morning. The last one was given at 9 o'clock at night. They alternated between this church and St. Mary's Church across the street. There was Novena given every half hour. 
It was not unusual on a Tuesday for...